Morning, Calvary. Um, my name is David, and it's great to be with you. I serve as a pastor in Syracuse, but have the opportunity to be here uh, usually once to twice a year for the last 10 years, I think. So uh, this feels like church away from church for us, and uh, we're so good to see you here this Labor Day weekend. You know, our society has this obsessive interest in the end of the world. Um, all you have to do is look at the movies and the television shows. It feels like every other movie and every other television show is about some apocalyptic future, some dystopian future where humankind is now fighting for survival against zombies or aliens or robots or the worst zombie alien robots. <laughs> You know, we, we love thinking about what that'll be like, and, and our world can't stop making films and telling stories about what the end of the world will be like. But Christians, of course, are also very interested in the end of the world. You know, I grew up in a time in the church world where the end of the world felt like it was the only thing we talked about. And I remember every New Year's Eve, we had this event at our church called a watch night service that was literally dedicated to watching for Jesus Christ's return. And at some point that night, we would watch these 1970s end time films. One of them was called A Thief in the Night. And I think the purpose of these films was literally just to scare you to the altar. And I was terrified of being left behind if Jesus came back. And so every year as a child, I had the exact same New Year's resolution. Don't get left behind this year. <laughs> In this passage that we're going to look at in Mark chapter 13, Jesus is talking about the end of the world. He's actually talking about two different future events. One was in his near future, 70 AD, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. But the other was in the far future. In fact, it's an event that is still in our future. It's the return of Jesus. And when we talk about Jesus' return and the return of Christ, Christians tend to agree on two things and disagree about everything else. The two things that Christians agree on is first, that Jesus will return at the end of time. This was prophesied in the Old Testament. Jesus himself said that he would return. It was promised at his ascension. It's referenced repeatedly in New Testament writings. And the final verse in the Bible is a prayer for Jesus to return, inviting us to pray the same, Jesus, come quickly. So Christians agree Jesus will return. Christians also, secondly, tend to agree that when Jesus returns, he will in some way finally and fully establish his kingdom. Kingdom simply meaning his reign and his rule over every corner of creation. So those are the two things that all Christians tend to agree on. Jesus will return, and when he returns, he will finally and fully establish his kingdom. Everything else we disagree on. And there's plenty of discussion and debate about how Jesus will return when he will return, and most of the disagreement and debate revolves around the sequence of events before he returns and the sequence of events after he returns. But in our passage this morning, when Jesus talks about the end of the world, in his typical frustrating fashion, he actually doesn't share our interest. He doesn't care about the things that we tend to care about. And as we're going to see from this passage, there's really two primary things that Jesus wants to communicate when he talks to his disciples about the end of the world. And the first one is that he wants to inform them that none of us know those time, the timeline or the details. It says, we're going to read it in just a moment, that Jesus said, no one knows when I am going to return. And so if you ever come across a preacher in person or online who's trying to predict the day that Jesus Christ will return, run in the opposite direction. We do not know when he will return. And by the way, that doesn't mean we can't know the seasons or have a sense of the times. And I know a lot of people who feel like we're in the last days and this feels like Jesus must be returning soon. I just want to throw this out to you. Every generation that has existed since Jesus ascended to heaven believed they were the generation that Jesus was going to return. It doesn't mean he won't in our generation, but just know that every generation has had that expectation. But the second thing that Jesus does in this passage is he instructs us that there's actually something so much more important to do with the time we have than to have endless debates about how the world is going to end. And so the big idea this morning is this. The promise of Jesus' return was given to you and me, not so that we might argue with each other about its details, but so that we might encourage each other with its certainty. 
The promise of Jesus' return was given to us, not so that we might argue with each other about its details, but that we might encourage each other with its certainty. So let's look at this passage, Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 31. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But concerning that day or that hour, and now Jesus is talking about his return, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now Jesus is speaking in his incarnation at this point, that he has embraced his incarnation and his humanity to the point that he, at this time, in saying these words, did not himself know his return. He knows now, he didn't know when he spoke these words. Verse 33, be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. And then Jesus tells a story like he often would. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and it commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all. So for all of us this morning, this is Jesus' words to us. Stay awake. So this morning, what we're going to see is that Jesus' return means three things. And the first thought here is controversial, I think. The second one is confrontational. And the third one is comforting. All right. So the first thing that we learn from this passage is that Jesus will return to his own. Jesus will return to his own. A couple weeks ago, my family and I, we went to Bethany Beach, Delaware. We got away for some vacation, had a great time. And we're one of those families that even when we're on vacation on Sundays, we're looking to go to church somewhere. And so, you know, I, I don't, I'm not very picky about where I go to church on vacation. I have two priorities. Number one, they teach the Bible. And number two, it's near where I want to eat lunch. As long as those two things are in place, that's where we're going to church. And so I was reading online all the different churches. I was reading to my family and I, I mentioned the different denominations. I said, there's a Presbyterian church actually very close by. And one of my daughters, I have three daughters, 14, 11, and eight. One of my daughters uh, said, Presbyterian church? And I thought, oh, this would be interesting. She has theological thoughts about the doctrine of the Presbyterians. And then she, very confused look on her face, said, there is a church for people who only eat fish? <laughs> Pescatarian. <laughs> I don't know what it says about me as a dad that my daughters have a better vocabulary with food than faith. <laughs> um, we had a great time on vacation, and we loved being there. But you know this. Many of you had the opportunity to go on vacation probably this summer. Uh, you get home, and you just realize, what's he saying? Everyone says it when they get home on vacation. There's no place like home. You know, you enjoy where you're at. You have a great time. But, like, there's no place like getting back to your own home and opening up your own fridge with your own food and your own drinks in there and sitting on your own couch or in your own recliner and watching your own TV and using your own reliable Wi-Fi, using your own bathroom, sitting on your own toilet, lying in your own bed. There's nothing like coming back to what is your own. And when Jesus returns at the end of time, he's coming to and for his own, which means he has a claim on everything. It all belongs to him. In the parable, the possessive pronoun his is used repeatedly to communicate this truth that Jesus is returning to his house for his servants who are doing his work because he is the master of the house. Everything belongs to Jesus because everything is from Jesus. And in the book of Colossians, Paul writes these beautiful words. This actually was a hymn that the early church would have sung when they gathered. Beginning in verse 15, speaking of Jesus, Paul says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is the one who made God visible to our natural eyes. He's the firstborn of all creation, which doesn't mean that he came after God the Father. It means that he has the privileges and all of the responsibilities and all of the power of the firstborn. Verse 16, for by Jesus, Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in Jesus all things hold together. That's a good word for some of us this morning who feel like we can't hold our lives together, we can't hold our families together, we can't hold our health, our future. We can't even hold ourselves together. 
And yet Paul says, in Christ, all things, all of your junk, all of your stuff, all of your concerns, all of your issues are held together in Christ. It all came from him. It's all for him. It belongs to him. And what this means is that we do not own our lives. We do not own our stuff, but everything we have is on loan from Jesus to whom it all belongs. This means our time, our talents, our resources, our bodies, our minds, our souls, our spirits. They all belong to Jesus. They're all from Jesus. And someday he will return for his own. Now, the truth is, is we don't actually like this. I don't know what it is about kids, but kids, usually two of the very first words that kids learn to speak are no and mine, right? You don't have to teach a kid to say no and say mine. I know, this, I know kids learn other words early like mama and daddy and go bills and stuff like that in your house, but no and mine. There's something in our nature that wants to hold on to things and claim it as our own. But Jesus here, and here's the controversy, when he comes back, he's not coming back for what is yours, he's coming back for what is his. It all belongs to him. And if Jesus is returning to his own, then Jesus has something to say. I, actually, I would say Jesus has everything to say about how we use his stuff, how we steward his things, our time, our talents and our treasures are to be invested on his behalf with preference for his priorities and his will. Our minds are to be transformed. Our lives are to be conformed. We are bearing the image of God and we are called to bear it well. We serve a creator to whom we are accountable for the way that we live our lives because God has a specific plan for humankind, how we will live free and how we will flourish. We have to answer to the one who is returning to his own. We see from the resurrected Jesus Christ that our eternal existence is not a disembodied one, which means in heaven, in the new heavens and the new earth, we will not float around like Casper the ghost, just, ooh, like going around doing things, floating through walls. We will have actual resurrected bodies. Jesus had a resurrected body. He ate fish on the beach with his disciples. You and I will have resurrected bodies in the new heavens and the new earth. And so our bodies are sacred and they belong to God. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Now, Paul uses this phrase, temple of the Holy Spirit, multiple times in the New Testament, but as far as I know, this is the only time where he uses it in the singular form. Every other time when he says, you are the temple of God, he's saying, all of you together, the body of Christ are the temple of God, but here he's talking about the sacredness of our bodies so he, he, he zooms in and says, your body, singular, is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. And here's the five words that bring all the controversy in our culture and society today. You are not your own. You couldn't say anything more controversial right now in our world, that you are not your own. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. The reason why this goes against the grain, the reason why this is so hard for society here is because our highest cultural values right now are summarized with wor by words like self-reliance, self-expression, self-actualization, self-realization, self-promotion, self-definition, self, self, self. But when I look at the scriptures, the kingdom of God and the culture of the kingdom of God values things like self-denial, self-forgetfulness, self-sacrifice and dying to self. So this is not popular that Jesus is returning for his own. And no one really likes this because all of us in our hearts still want to wrap our arms around things and say, mine. But at least can we agree that just because we don't like something doesn't mean it's not true, right? I mean, I don't like the fact that the only way to get healthy and lose weight is to eat better and exercise more. I don't like it. But I'm standing in front of you as almost 44 years of evidence that it's true. It is true. That's the only way to get healthy. But not liking it doesn't make it not true. And not liking this doesn't make it not true. Jesus is going to return to his own. It's all his. Second thing that we see in this passage, and this is the confrontational thought, is that Jesus will return for those who are awake, which means there are some he's returning for, and there's some that he has not 
returning for. In this passage, Jesus provides a sobering future view so that his followers may practice prayerful discernment in which trust in God and faithfulness to God are paramount. The instructions that Jesus is giving here aims at godly lives now. Here's what I'm saying. Jesus' interest in Mark 13 and talking about his return and the end of the world is not how things will be on that day, but rather on how we should live our lives on this day. Jesus' interest is less about the future and more about the present. How does future truth inform the way we live today? Jesus is looking for us to be faithful in the work that he's called us to do and not to be caught up in the trivial. Think about the workers in this parable. If they spend all their time talking to each other and arguing with each other and debating with each other about when the master would return, trying to read the signs and trying to understand when is he going to return, do you know what they wouldn't have time to do? His work, the work that he has called them to do. And as Christians, we have to be so careful because the things that drag us down are not always sin. Sometimes it's just distractions. Sometimes it's not bad, it's just not the best. For the last few years, every pastor I talk to has observed the same thing. We are a distracted church. We're distracted by what's happening in this world. We're distracted by things that are not unimportant, but things that are not primary. And Jesus has his concern that his people will be so caught up in things that really don't matter that they will not be faithful. And when he comes, they will actually be asleep in their distractions instead of awake and serving him. Now, Jesus actually tells a few different versions of this parable that we read this morning. And in Matthew 25, it's called the parable of the talents. And again, it's a man who leaves. But before he leaves, he gives his three servants talents. To one servant, he gives five. And to one servant, he gives two. And to one servant, he gives one. And he says, when I return, I, I want to see what you've done with them. And so the master returns. And the one who had five says, I, I was wise and I invested and I worked and I was awake and I was at work. And I, so here's five back. 10. He comes to the person with two who says, I had two and now I have two more. I've doubled. Here's four. And then the last one who had one said, I didn't do anything with it. I buried it. And that one ends up being punished for his lack of awakeness and workfulness. And there's a couple of things that we notice and we learn from this parable. The first thing that I love is that the person who had five and gave back the master 10 and the person who had two and gave back the master four, both received the identical words from the master. They both received the same gratitude and affirmation. What does that mean? It means this, you are not responsible for the gifts that someone else has. You know, if you have your two gifts and you're giving back the Lord four gifts, that's what he's asking you to do. Don't worry about people who seem to have five gifts and are giving back the Lord 10 gifts. You are responsible for the gifts that you have. But the second thing that we learn is you are not responsible for others, but also you are responsible for yours. That means being awake and alert. It means being awake to who God is. A.W. Tozer wrote, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Are we awake to who God is? Are we aware? Everyone out there has opinions and thoughts about who God is, but how do we know who God actually is? The best way to know is to go to scripture, to be in God's word. And the number one Bible study question that I think Christians should ask whenever they're reading the Bible is this. Anytime you're reading the Bible, here's the first question you should ask. What does this passage reveal about the nature and character of God? And if you ask that question first, then you're in great shape. What does this passage reveal about the nature and the character of God? Being awake and aware to God when we gather. Being awake and aware to God in our spiritual devotions, in our spiritual disciplines. But also being awake and aware to who God is outside of church. The rest of our week. As you, students, as you head off to school this week, as we go to work, as we play, as we shop, what does it look like for Christians to be awake and aware to the active workings of God in our life? Listening, having your listening to the Father. What are you saying to me? How are you leading me? How are you directing me? Being awake to who God is, but also being awake to who we are, how God has made us, but also our weaknesses. A, a few weeks ago, um, my wife and our three girls, we went out to this uh, restaurant that we love in Syracuse, a Chinese restaurant. And uh, after dinner, we had a lot of leftovers. I always like to order extra because I love bringing home leftovers. And so they, they gave us a box of leftovers. And so I handed it to one of my daughters and I said, 
make sure this makes it to the car. This is our leftovers. And so we, we pack up, we get to go, and, and we're leaving, and, we're, and we're, we're headed out to the car, and all of a sudden, a waiter comes running out the door. Hey, guys, hey, guys, excuse me, your leftovers. And I was like, oh, thank you. And I took it from the waiter, and I handed it to my daughter and kind of gave her a look like, really? Like, you had one job. <laughs> you know how much food means to your dad. <laughs> like... And I don't think I was a jerk to her, but I definitely was kind of like exasperated a little bit, right? And we're my youngest daughter's in a wheelchair, and we're loading her wheelchair into our van, and I hear the waiter come back out again. He goes, sir, sir, your credit card. <laughs> <laughs> we don't see ourselves very well. <laughs> Here's my question. Who is helping you see yourself? Who's helping you see yourself? Who's asking you hard questions? Who has permission to say hard things to you? Our, our natural tendency is to surround ourselves with people who affirm us and approve of our every choice and take our side or in our corner. And that's great. We need friends like that. But if you surround yourself with friends who support your every life decision, no matter what, and come to your side, in every single agreement, you may have some fans, but you don't have friends. Because friends can speak the truth in love. And one of the truths that is increasingly hard to navigate in our world today is that friends can disagree and still love one another. They can disagree with each other, and, and in fact, it's their love for each other sometimes that leads them into healthy disagreement. You and I have very little chance of being awake when Jesus returns if we cut out of our lives every voice that challenges us and confronts us. Be careful that your efforts to insulate yourself from people who you don't agree with or don't agree with you on everything doesn't result in you actually isolating yourself from the truth that you need to hear. So what's obvious in this parable is this. Jesus is drawing a line. Jesus says some are awake and some are not awake. And Jesus gets to decide his perfect wisdom, his perfect justice, his perfect grace. Jesus knows the wheat from the tares. He knows those that are awake and those that are sleeping. And by the way, this is the point where some people go, well, here, this is actually my problem with Christianity. This is the problem with Christianity, that you have a moral standard and that you're trying to impose it on other people. It's wrong for you to impose your moral standard on others. But you hear it, right? I mean, that statement itself is a moral judgment. To say it's wrong to impose moral standards on someone else is to impose your moral standards on someone else. Everyone has a standard of right and wrong. Everyone has a moral high ground that they will stand on when they feel prompted to. Everyone has categories for those who are awake to truth, those who are alert to truth, those who are aware of what matters most, and those who are not. Everyone has those standards. The question is, where did you get your standard from? How reliable is it? How true is it? We may not like this, but the truth is, is that we need a standard of right and wrong from outside of ourselves just to navigate life, just to get through life, just to be a society. We need some standard of right or right and wrong. Otherwise, it just becomes like the postmodern sort of post-truth world that we live in, and philosophers say the problem is, is everything turns into, this is the phrase they use, the grand says who. This is wrong, says who. This is right, says who. And as a society, all of a sudden, we have no foundations to stand on or to agree upon if you can't deem something to be right or wrong outside of ourselves. Tim Keller says it this way. He says, if there is no final judge, if there is no perfect justice, what hope is there for the world? How do we call people out for wrong things if there's no standard? How do we say what is acceptable and what is not if there is not? What hope is there for our world? But if there is a final judge and if there is perfect justice, then what hope is there for me? <laughs> and this is where we get to our last point. I'm gonna have John and the band come up. In this passage, we see that this is also a source of comfort. Here's the last point. When Jesus returns, he will return and he will remain forever. He will return and he will remain forever. Jesus emphasizes that the catastrophic events, whether he was talking about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, or whether he was talking about the end of the world and some of the catastrophic events that may accompany that, he's saying it should not dishearten the followers. 
his faithful. Because Jesus is not coming the second time like he came the first time. He's not coming like a baby in a manger. He's coming as a ruling king. And we are to hold on to the hope of his return because when Jesus returns, he's not just coming as an authoritative judge. If he was only a judge, that'd be bad news for you and me. He's not just coming as an authoritative judge, he's coming as our ultimate redeemer. Because Jesus Christ, the one who actually could judge us, he actually speaks for us. The one who could sit up high and judge us and rule against us becomes our advocate. The one who speaks for us. The one who stands in our place. The one who hung in our place. Because Jesus Christ at the cross was the just and the justifier. He was the standard of God's righteousness, but through his sacrificial sacrifice and his work, he became the one who would justify all of us because of our inability to stay awake, to be alert, to be about his work. He did the work necessary. And at the cross, the mercy and justice of God collides. And Jesus takes the justice and we get the mercy. And when he returns, he will return, yes, as a judge, but also as a redeemer, as a king. And he will remain. The first verse we read, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away. Some people think that's a quantitative statement that heaven and earth as we currently know it will cease to exist and we will all be somewhere totally different. Some people believe that it's a qualitative statement that heaven and earth as we currently know it will cease to exist and it will be all made new. And I don't think it necessarily matters. What matters is this, that when it passes away, his word remains true. His promises are true. So when Jesus returns, it's to remain, it's to rule, and it's to reign. And on that day, this is what we'll know. He kept his promise. Let me finish with this. In 1 Thessalonians 4.18, Paul is writing to a group of believers who, like every other generation since, thought Jesus was going to return while they were still on earth. But then their friends started to die and Jesus wasn't back yet. And they had a crisis of faith. What does this mean? What happens to them? So in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul is writing to them about the resurrection and the return of Jesus. And in verse 18, he says, after his summary of all of this is, encourage one another with these words. When we talk about the return of Jesus and the end of times, Paul's instruction is to encourage one another with these words. Now, this is not actually how the church has used these words. We use these words to scare people to manipulate people into a decision, to um, debate with others, to prove that we're smarter than others. But Paul says, encourage one another with these words. Now, if you're a believer here this morning, a follower of Jesus, when's the last time you did this for yourself? You're having a bad day. You received a diagnosis from the doctor. You have a relationship that's falling apart. You have a child that's walking away. You have a marriage that's on the ropes. You have a work situation that's a nightmare. When's the last time in the midst of that moment you reminded your heart, Jesus will return and remain forever? This is not escapism. This is not escapism. It doesn't get us there. It gives us the strength to live here and now. When's the last time you did this for a friend, a Christian friend, as they were going through a situation? Paul says, encourage them. Don't forget, I know these times are hard. I know these things are difficult, but don't forget, Jesus will return. We're not left without a hope. We're not left, as he says in John, as orphans. He's returning to bring us home to the Father. And on that day, I wonder if on that day in the light of eternity, we will look back at all the things that stole our joy, sabotaged our peace, corrupted our relationships, emptied our souls, uh, stole and cost us our destinies. And we'll look back on that day in the light of eternity and say, what? That little thing stole my joy, robbed me of peace, kept me from my purpose. I'm not making light of what you're going through at all. But I do believe this, there's a day coming where we're gonna see it all tremendously differently. That thing lured me to sleep when the world needs us as Christians awake, 
alert, doing his will, being his people, loving this community, serving one another, laying our lives down, preferring one another. Jesus' words, stay awake. Don't let this world lure you to sleep. Stay awake in the light of eternity. And in this story, Jesus is trying to help us. And here's how he's trying to help us. He's trying to say to us, live now like you will live then. Live now like you will live then. How will you live then? Free and awake. And there's grace. There's grace for it. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you this morning that your words are true and your promises are sure. We thank you that a day is coming when you will bring us home and we'll see you face to face and we'll become like you, changed in that moment. And in this waiting time, give us grace and strength to be your people awake and alert to your purposes and your plans for our lives. Fill our moments with meaning and purpose. And help us to be aware and awake to what you're leading us to do by your grace, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing.